And so, you know, on to presentations and symptoms. And so this really is, is the difference between eosinophilic esophagitis and the other eosinophilic gastrointestinal diseases is, is where it is most striking um, because symptoms really depend on location and, and symptoms in other eosinophilic gastrointestinal diseases can be really variable. Um, you know, obviously it's going to present differently if it's in the colon or if it's in the, uh, if in the stomach. And so you can, you know, you can see obvious manifestations. So on the, on the top right, you have a picture of a very inflamed and angry colon. And you can very easily imagine that someone with that, that level of inflammation in their colon would have diarrhea, would have possibly bloody diarrhea and a, and a presentation much the same way as someone with ulcerative colitis or another type of uh, colon disease. And then someone who has a, you know, a lot of epigastric abdominal pain uh, or, or vomiting might have a, a significant ulcerative disease in their stomach, which could easily explain their presentation. And then there's less obvious symptoms. And on the lower right picture, you see someone who has a fluid accumulation in their be belly called, uh, called ascites. And that can also be a manifestation of eosinophilic gastrointestinal diseases of the small bowel. And so... EGID locations are, are related to the related to the organs involved. The symptoms and the manifestations are related to, to whatever organs are involved with the eosinophilic infiltr infiltration. In uh, in gastric um, uh, or eosinophilic gastritis, um, you see upper abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. You feel the the uh, the sensation of feeling full very easily or early satiety, and then on endoscopy you could see ulcers or, or uh, visible inflammation. In the small intestinal um, or eosinophilic gastroenteritis, you can see diarrhea, you can see bloating from malabsorptive features, um, you can see crampy abdominal pain, you can have malabsorption from, uh, from the lining of the small bowel being affected. And then you can get you know, bloating and diarrhea also from uh, if you have uh, eosinophilic infiltration of the muscle layer of the uh, small bowel, or then that causes a, an abnormality in the motility of small bowel, which can predispose to, to bacteria remaining in the small bowel and leading to bacterial overgrowth. And then in the colon, we think about diarrhea and bloody diarrhea pre predominantly with eosinophilic colitis. And then I think one of the more challenging parts of the uh, eosinophilic uh, gastroenteritides uh, is that um, uh, symptoms and, and presentations can also depend on where in the bowel. So, you know, in eosinophilic esophagitis, we really don't think of this. And, you know, if we just depend on the, if we just think about the location of inflammation being the stomach or the colon, uh, then we really miss a lot of the GI tract because, you know, when we think about inflammation, we think about it being visible or visible with a scope. And that's really only on the surface of the bowel, the mucosal layer of the bowel. And I spend a lot of time talking to my patients that that it's not just that part, it's just not what's visible or on the inside. You also have a muscular layer, um, and then behind the muscular layer, you have a serosal layer that then, that then is in direct contact with the abdominal cavity. And so you can get actually eosinophilic infiltration in any of those layers of the bowel, and that can also change the presentation symptoms and course of the disease. Um, and so, you know, the depth of inflammation will change the symptoms. So if on the surface of the bowel or the surface of the small bowel or colon, you have muc the mucosa is affected, that's where you get the ulceration, that's where you get pain, that's where you get bleeding and diarrhea and malabsorption, you know, and that's often the easiest uh, to see. But you also can get the, you can get inflammation or infiltration of eosinophils in the muscularis uh, uh, layer of the bowel. And that's where you can get things like obstructive symptoms or, uh, or dysmotility of the bowel, um, ileus or, or kind of a paralysis of the small bowel. And that's where you can get also when the, the small bowel isn't, um, isn't providing normal transit of intestinal contents, there's stasis or, or slowing of intestinal contents. And there's nothing uh, that likes stasis more than bacteria. And you can get basically a bacterial accumulation in the small bowel that we call bacterial overgrowth that again presents symptoms uh, that, uh, uh, that, that make the symptoms of eosinophilic gastroenteritis even worse. And then perhaps most dramatically, you can see eosinophilic inf uh, infiltration in kind of the last layer, the serosa of the, of the bowel. And that's the, the layer that's in direct contact with the abdominal cavity or the peritoneal cavity. Um, and there you can get kind of persistent inflammation that drives a fluid um, exodus from the bowel into the abdominal cavity, and you get an eosinophilic fluid uh, buildup in the bowel and eosinophilic ascites, which can be among the more dramatic uh, presentations of eosinophilic gastroenteritis. 
you know, and so, so the, this variety of symptoms is in, in contrast, uh, at least as an adult gastroenterologist, to, to eosinophilic esophagitis, which I'll kind of highlight. And, and with adults, it's a, it's a fairly bland symptomatic presentation that focuses mainly on difficulty swallowing. In the, in the eosinophilic gastroenteritides, it's a, it's a much more diverse presentation, can be more challenging and, uh, uh, and also uh, very severe. You can get the significant bleeding and then uh, significant uh, dysmotilities leading to malabsorption and profound malnutrition.